Um, very warm welcome, everybody, to this last session of our series, Stockholm Plus 50, Five Decades of Global Environmental Governance. It's my turn today um, for this last session, the last of 12 sessions, to draw a synthesis. The lecture is entitled The Environment and Global Sustainability Governance. My name is Lena Pratsch. I'm Professor of Comparative Politics at the Otto Suhr Institute, comparative politics with a focus on environmental and climate politics. Um, this lecture will be structured as follows. Um, the first part, in the first part, I will talk about the concept um, of the lecture series and remind us of the lectures we've heard so far. And then in the second part, I draw a synthesis along three guiding questions. First, a bit of background. Why did we organize this lect lecture series? Um, it sounds a bit self-evident, but humans are dramatically accelerating global environmental change. And I think this became clear in all the lectures for the different environmental policy fields. We are outside in the safe operating space for four of nine so-called planetary boundaries, including, but not only, climate change. We call this lecture series Stockholm Plus 50, uh, Five Decades of Global Environmental Governance, because five decades ago in Stockholm in 1972, um, the international community met for the first time for an international summit to collectively address global environmental problems. Since then, um, we must say so, um, global environmental governance has been quite ineffective because global environmental change is still accelerating. And now we face the coronavirus pandemic and the Russian invasion of the Ukraine. And the question really is, is this a risk or an opportunity for environmental governance? Our starting point for, for this lecture series was Agenda 2030. Agenda 2030 is the center, the, the Agenda 2030 document is the central document adopted by the UN uh, in the field of uh, sustainable governance, global sustainability governance. The UN General Assembly adopted this document in, 19, uh, in 2015, and it includes a set of 17 wide-ranging goals that define what the international community wants to achieve when we say sustainable development. So 17 wide-ranging goals and even more sub-targets and particular indicators to measure progress towards these goals. The so-called sustainable development goals reside of two are the result of two processes. Um, first, the Millennium Development Goals. Um, they were adopted in 2000 and lasted until 2015, and they only applied to the developing countries, to the Global South. So this is the development policy path that led to, to the SDGs. And then we also have an environmental policy path um, uh, in the sense that the SDGs are the result of the documents of the 2012 Rio Plus 20 Summit, which augmented Agenda 21 uh, of the 1992 Rio Earth Summit and um, the before mentioned Stockholm Conference. So Agenda 2030 tries to integrate uh, the development and environment agenda. Yet what we've also seen in all the lectures, goal prioritization is not entirely unavoidable, especially when it comes uh, to implementation. And this integration of environment and development agenda is quite controversial. So in um, what we see is that the Brundtlands Commission three pillar concept um, prevails in global sustainability governance. Um, this means that uh, we have a social, economic, and environmental dimension of sustainability. And the Bontheim concept basically aims to integrate these three dimensions. But already in the negotiations to Agenda 2030, environmental scientists demanded to rather prioritize ecosystem protection because ecosystems are a precondition, intact ecosystems are the precondition for all human life and also for economic activities. However, developing countries insisted on prioritizing economic development when Agenda 2030 was negotiated, and many scholars argue that only an integrative approach allowed for a compromise. So the central research question is now, which position does the environment have in global sustainability governance? 
And to answer this question, we first need to uh, identify the SDGs that count for the environment. This is one of the first illustrations, uh, first figures that tries to illustrate the different dimensions of sustainability um, uh, in a, with Agenda 2030 um, by Vage et al. Uh, it's, you see three circles. The outer circle is um, what they call the natural environment. Then the middle circle is what they call infrastructure, that's the economic dimension. And then an inner circle of well-being, that's possibly the social dimension. What's crucial for us now is that the natural environment consists in this figure of three SDGs, SDG 13, climate action, SDG 14, life below water, and SDG 15, life on land. And I think everybody agrees that these three goals really are green goals, environmental goals. So the first lecture is focused on these three green goals. Yeah. Miranda Schreier started our lecture series um, with a lecture on international climate change politics, followed by Daniela Kleinschmidt, who spoke about SDG 15 and with a particular life on land with a particular focus on global forest governance. And then Alice Vadro gave the third lecture on SDG 14 and global ocean governance. This is an other figure um, uh, uh, that illustrates the different dimensions of sustainability in Agenda 2030. I think at least two lecturers um, showed this, this figure before. Um, it's called the wedding cake or the wedding cake model. Here you see three layers of sustainability. Um, the bottom layer, the fundament, is um, the so-called biosphere layer. Then we have a middle layer called society, and only the top layer, the cream of the cake, is the economy. And Falke et al. insist that the biosphere is basically the basis for, for the society and for the economy. So we first of all need to protect um, the biosphere. And what they consider to belong to this biosphere, um, to this environmental dimension, in addition to SDG 13, 14, and 15 is SDG 6. SDG 6 on water. And some consider SDG 6, um, which is on clean water and sanitation and environmental goals, some consider it a social goal. SDG 1 very much follows um, the wording of the Millennium Development Goal 7C, which aims to half the proportion of people without access to drinking water and sanitation by the time by, by 2015, because the Millennium Development Goals were adopted in 2000 and lasted until 2015. And now with the Sustainable Development Goals, SDG 6.1, um, we aim um, to by, by 2030 to achieve universal access, universal and equitable access to safe drinking water, and also then with SDG 6.2 to sanitation and hygiene. So one can argue, argue that SDG 6 very much follows the MDG, um, and uh, this MDG, MDG 7, C was accomplished years ahead of time, yeah? So the international was, community was very successful in expanding water infrastructure and to give access uh, to more and more people. But the environmental performance of this and other MDGs was very bad, yeah? And now we can argue that we kind of learned yeah, with SDG 6, there's also an environmental component included in this water target. Um, we also aim to improve water quality by reducing pollution. We aim for greater water use efficiency, sustainable withdrawals, integrated water resource management at all levels, and um, we aim to protect and restore water-related ecosystems. And as there's this, also this environmental component to SDG 6, I think it's reasonable to argue that it is also an environmental goal. It's both. It's a social and an environmental goal. However, I invited two lecturers to speak about SDG 6. Um, the first lecture by Manuel Fischer was more on, the, or he comes more from an environmental angle, so he emphasized the environmental dimension of water in his talk, and you can see he came here to this lecture hall. 
And um, then we had the first online lecture with Laila Mehta. And she spoke in particular about um, synergies between SDG 2, which is on agri-food governance, um, zero hunger, and then the interrelations with SDG 6. And she came more from a, from a human rights uh, uh, perspective. Human, uh, she applied, used a human rights approach. Yeah, so the water goal has, has these two dimensions, an environmental dimension and a social dimension. SDG 7 then is very similar to SDG 6. SDG 7 is about affordable and clean energy. Here the focus is also on infrastructure expansion and uh, universal access, um, in this case, to uh, modern energy services. Some also consider SDG 7 an environmental goal because it also includes this sub-target that we aim to increase the share of renewables in in the global energy mix. However, this is not necessary to accomplish SDG 7. It would also be sufficient, uh, um, or we, we could also argue that we um, accomplish this, uh, this target only by uh, the expansion of infrastructure based on fossil fuels. And of course, this would have tremendous negative uh, effects on, on the environment. However, also the expansion of renewable energy infrastructure can have negative environmental impact. And in contrast to SDG 6, SDG 7 doesn't have an environmental component. There's no consideration of scarce resources and environmental restoration in SDG 7. Therefore, I would argue that SDG 7 is not an environmental goal per se, but it's highly environmentally relevant. And I invited Andreas Goltau to speak about SDG 7. So we heard a lecture on the energy goal. Um, his lecture was entitled Clean Energy Services, Universal Access as an Enabler for Development? Question mark. There are more SDGs with environmentally relevant sub-targets. For in instance, SDG 2, I already mentioned this. Um, the need, um, which includes the need to increase agricultural productivity and production that help maintain ecosystems, that's a sub-target. We also have SDG 12, on sustainable, uh, which is about, um, on responsible uh, consumption and production and aims for sustainable management and efficient use of natural resources. However, um, there's no sufficiency target included in, in SDG 12. It's mainly about efficiency no sufficiency target in the sense of self-limitation and renunciation. And there's also SDG 5 on gender equality, which also includes this sub-target that we should undertake reforms to give women equal rights to economic resources, as well as access to ownership and control over, among other things, natural resources. So we also heard two lectures on SDG 5 and SDG 12, and I think um, SDG, the lecture on SDG 5 was probably the most popular one. Um, Sherilyn McGregor and also Lameki came, came here to this lecture hall. Um, their a lecture was entitled, We Will Not Be Mainstreamed Into a Polluted Stream, an Ecofeminist Critique of SDG 5. And then another online lecture with Magnus Bankson. He spoke about realizing sustainable consumption and production and focused on SDG 12. Both lectures on SDG 5 and SDG 12 were already quite critical, but probably from an environmental perspective, um, SDG 8 is the most controversial one. SDG 8 calls for both sustained and sustainable economic growth and employment. And some even consider this goal an environmental goal because of its sub-target 8.4, which aims to improve progressively uh, through 2030 global resource efficiency in consumption and production, and um, it endeavors to, to decouple economic growth from environmental degradation. Yeah? So this could be considered an environmental sub-target, but then target 8.1 defines per capita economic growth 
of at least 7% gross domestic product growth per annum in the least developed countries. And Hickel um, calculated that this um, translates into an aggregate global GDP growth of 3%, which would require a decarbonization of more than 7% per annum if we still want to accomplish the two degree target, um, which was agreed upon under the Paris Agreement under the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change. Yeah, and this is something all scholars basically consider impossible. Yeah, in particular, as SDG 9, um, defines or clarifies that economic growth should be based on industrialization. Yeah, so this is highly problematic from an environmental perspective. And I invited Ekaterina Shatkovskaya to speak about SDG 8. She gave a lecture then instead on degrowth, um, and her lecture was entitled From Economic Growth to Socio-Ecological Transformations, Rethinking Visions of Economy and Work under SDG 8. Finally, we heard two more lectures on SDGs which are relevant, environmentally relevant with regard to their implementation. SDG 11 on sustainable cities and communities and SDG 17 on partnerships, um, partnerships for the goals. So Anna Kozovac and Daniel Pejic um, gave a spotlight on urban settlements and Philip Patberg and Montserrat Koller von um, spoke about partnerships for the goals and how um, partnerships can be nexus facilitators in particular with regard to the green goals. So here you see all 11 <laughs> lectures again and the lectures we heard. And now in the second part of my lecture I try to draw a synthesis um, of th this lecture series. The lecture series, and several lecturers mentioned this, is um, linked to a book project. So in advance to the lectures, um, or each lecture is based on, on a book chapter, and in, in advance to the lectures, and also for preparing the book chapters, the lecturers all received um, three guiding questions. The first um, deals with perceptions of sustainable development, and I wanted to know how perceptions of sustainable development have changed over the last uh, decades. Then the second question concerns ex actors and institutions that matter, most mattered for, for each environmental policy subfield. And then the third question is actually the question that when we discussed with the students um, was considered the most interesting one. Um, about alternative and innovative forms of governance that exist and deserve more research attention. So I start now with my synthesis regarding the first question, um, perceptions of sustainable development. What we could see, especially in the, in the first lectures on the green goals, was that the environment is increasingly perceived as a global good. And this is true for, the cl for climate change politics. Yeah? We increasingly see market mechanisms such as CO2 taxes and so on adopted for, for this field of climate change politics. But it's also true for other policy fields. For instance, oceans are being developed economically as Alice Badrou outlined. And Daniela Kleinschmidt emphasized that um, Forests are no longer only seen um, as a commodity in terms of timber that we harvest and can then sell and trade, but forests under the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change increasingly become um, commodities also in the sense that forest protection and reforestation programs are financially compensated. So um, the environment is increasingly perceived as a global commodity in many ways. And several lecturers emphasized that this is controversial and can also be a problem, especially uh, Laila Meta and Alice Badrou emphasize that ecosystems have a value on their own and need to be preserved as a precondition for human life and not only because they are good which you can use to, to make money. Also Daniela Kleinschmidt emphasized that it is con controversial whether uh, the environment is a global commodity and she emphasized that especially states abundant of natural resources 
Um, in particular, in her case, she works on global forest governance um, states with tropical forests. Um, they insist on their national sovereignty over their environment, over their forests, um, on, the, on their territory, and that they can decide themselves what to do with these forests and if they want to uh, treat the environment as a commodity or not, yeah, what to do with the, with the forest, and that it is not an international responsibility necessarily. The SDGs, and we saw this in our lectures, compromise different perceptions, but at the same time they neglect contestations and trade-offs, in particular with regard to economic growth and SDG 8. Back in the 1970s, we had the report on the limits to growth, and um, Ekaterina Shatkovskaya emphasized that back in the 1970s, it was clear that there are environmental limits, there are limits to growth. But then the three pillar concept was introduced by the Brundtland Commission and it became very popular with the 1992 Rio Earth Summit. And this concept tries to, um, tries to integrate and balance the social, economic and environmental dimension of sustainability. And now most popular the concept of green growth, especially since the Rio Plus 20 Summit, um, it became very popular um, even and even tries to <laughs> explain to us that it is possible to make money with the environment and, and environmental destruction. So from an, environ an anti-capitalist perspective, it's almost perverse that the limits, uh, environmental limits now serve uh, to make profit. And this is then related as uh, ecofeminists like Sherilyn McGregor and I know Oz Ursula Mackey also emphasized in, in their lecture, this is related to a shift in emphasis from feminized nature knowledge. We had in the past that the, 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 net, um, the environment was considered something um, yeah, that deserves care work, unpaid care work, mostly by women. And there's a shift now to more masculine technology management type of environmental governance. So while humans are dramatically accelerating global environmental change, natural resources and technologies are increasingly perceived as commodities that need only to be rationally managed. And if we rationally manage the environment, we could potentially solve global environmental problems. This is then related to uh, global north-south differences. Um, in general, the environment and, and environmental protection tends to be a concern mainly of the global north, like in the negotiation um, to Agenda 2030. And we also heard this in the lectures, the global south is primarily interested in socioeconomic development. Um, for instance, uh, water infrastructure expansion, energy infrastructure expansion, and so on. That's, of course, <laughs> because we don't have full energy supply yet in, in the global south. Yeah. Now, of course, it's also a big question like regarding our energy stability here in the Global North, how we can accomplish it, and whether this is possible um, with only renewables or whether we also need to increase fossil fuels again. Um, the, however, this North-South divide, um, which seems to be there at first sight, is related to political settings rather than only discrepancies between developed and developing countries. Local communities everywhere depend on an intact environment, and especially even in countries of the global south, especially if we see that the environment is con increasingly considered a commodity, then poorer people, of course, have less uh, resources to, to compensate for environmental destruction. So Magnus Bengtsson and Ekaterina Shatkoskaya um, highlighted that F we should rather talk about affluence rather than poverty, as affluence has been the crucial driver of environmental pressures. Yeah, but as we bring these two dimensions of environmental and development policy together, we, we mostly speak about how to address environmental problems for the poor and we forget to talk about um, what actually causes environmental, uh, environmental pressures. So I come to my interim summary regarding perceptions of uh, sustainable development. Um, socioeconomic development is generally prioritized in all 
uh, with regard to all the SDGs. This is something we learned in the lectures. Everybody considers environmental sustainability to be important, but it's a long-term uh, vision rather than a short-term um, need to protect the environment. Then as the environment is increasingly seen as a commodity, tension is mainly between those who possess the means to exploit the natural resources as a global commodity and those who do not. And this is then related to north-south asymmetries because it's mainly countries and people in the global north who have the means to, to exploit uh, the natural environment. This became particularly uh, clear, I think, in the lecture by Alice Badro on ocean governance. Um, at the same time, then poor people especially, but not only in the global south, are most vulnerable to the consequences of persistent environmental destruction. And I put this, um, this picture here of current far forest fires in the Berlin-Brandenburg region because I would like to <laughs> say again that it's not only climate change is real and it's happening not only in the global south, but it's also happening here and we need to address it everywhere. It's not just something far away. So who are the actors and institutions uh, who have mattered most to address these problems and who actually haven't addressed these problems sufficiently in the last five decades? What we can see um, in all the environmental policy sectors is that there's a fragmented and polycentric institutional landscape of global sustainability governance. Philip Patberg in particular spoke about silos, yeah? We, um, like, there's the climate change silo, the biodiversity silo, and so on. It's no integrated approach. It's very fragmented. And in a way, we also did this with the lecture series. <laughs> we repeated uh, thinking in silos. Um, as the, We had one lecture on climate change politics, then the second one was on biodiversity politics, ocean politics, and so on. The UN High-Level Political Forum was founded with Agenda 2030 and mandated to orchestrate uh, the SDGs implementation. However, um, this forum doesn't have authority to enforce anything on nation states. So scholars call the Agenda 2030 uh, um, global governance through goal setting. Each government is responsible for implementation on its own territory. And each government really means each government, so in the global north and the global south. Yeah, so Agenda 2030, um, for the first time, um, um, follows an universally inclusive approach. So all countries have committed to also take environmental action and not only to push for socioeconomic development. This also means then that the principle of common but differentiated responsibility, um, which was enshrined in Agenda 21, uh, cannot be or is not upheld anymore. And this is because of, yeah, of a changing world order and um, changing habits. Um, the biggest polluters, um, or the biggest polluter back in the 1970s were definitely um, the United States. The United States in 1972 um, had only 6% of the world's population, but produced more than one third of the global energy. Um, and today, China produces most of the world's CO2 emissions, yeah? 31%, followed by the United States still with 14%, and then India. And if we look at the biggest polluters per capita, then the US per capita emissions are still the highest, with uh, 14 tons, twice as high as in China and eight times higher than in India. Um, so although the United States were um, very much behind the Stockholm summit in 1972, they continue to be the biggest polluter in a way. And Germany is just a bit um, above China with a bit more than seven tons um, per capita per year. The problem is that we don't accomplish to reduce greenhouse gas emissions and environmental destruction in the global north. And then at the same time, total emissions increase because um, of the global south, because the global south 
um, the, the emissions um, from the Global South continue to rise sharply in line with economic industrialization. So which institutions, global institutions, could address uh, this problem of, clim of increasing greenhouse gas emissions, but also environmental destruction in general. Back in 1972, the international community founded the UN Environment Program, and that was something quite in innovative by the time to have a UN program, not even an organization, but at least a program um, focused on environmental protection. But this was something innovative five decades ago, and UNEP stayed relatively weak. It never boosted to World Environmental Organization. Unlike like in, this, in the same period, in the, in the early 1990s, we founded a World uh, Trade Organization. So this is as if at the supranational level we have an economic ministry, but we don't have an environmental ministry to uh, counterbalance um, economic policies. Only climate change politics, um, yeah, kind of came to, to a state that they can challenge economic and trade policies. So climate change politics is the strongest among other, in, among the environmental institutions with UNFCCC, earlier the Kyoto Protocol, and now the Paris Agreement. And also what Alice Vadro emphasized is that um, there is the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, the IPCC, that collects expertise and tries to find consensus among uh, researchers um, on climate change. We don't have something similar, for instance, in the ocean sector. No other sector also has an intergovernmental focal, like the sessions of the Conference of the Parties to the UNFCCC, like the COP conference in, in Glasgow in last November. I think we've all heard about it in, in the news, but um, we don't hear about meetings of the UN Forest Forum, for instance, yeah? So news don't even report about it. So climate change institutions are the only ones that potentially challenge the WTO and its liberal paradigm of free trade, where other environmental issues cannot rely on an equivalent institutional landscape for their defense. This is from the lecture um, by Daniela Kleinschmidt. And she showed us the multitude of institutions in global forest governance. And you can see in the middle, there's the UN Forest Forum, which is relatively weak. And what you also see is that now climate institutions became so strong, also affecting other environmental sectors, and also influencing, for instance, global forest governance. Then in addition, we have um, uh, non-state, private, multi-stakeholder bodies, um, like labeling organizations like the Forest Stewardship Council and the PEFC, we also have public institutions like the European Commission that tries to enforce legality verification, meaning that it also tries um, to enforce that timber is only locked legally even outside um, uh, the territory of, uh, of the EU member states. And then uh, Daniela also taught us about um, the Forest Declaration Platform, a platform, and this is only one among many others, where public and private actors can make pledges um, for re reforestation. So I come to my interim summary regarding actors and institutions. Um, the way forward tends to be polycentrism rather than further centralization in global sustainability governance. And this is then related to many questions we have. Um, we, um, Manu Fischer in particular emphasized this, that we need further empirical research um, regarding interactions between the global and the local level. Somehow it's always still assumed that at the global level decisions are made and then implemented at the local level, but this obviously does not happen. We also need more research on interactions between state and non-state actors. All scholars agreed that I mean, in general, it's very nice that we have all these different initiatives and we all have the impression that a lot is done to address environmental problems, but competing actors and institutions have been a hindrance to the overarching protection of the environment. That's one conclusion I take away 
from this lecture series. Now, possibly multiple crises offer an opportunity for reform. This leads me to, my, to the third guiding question regarding alternatives and innovative forms of governance. In the face of accelerating environmental change, and we've already seen this with different actors and institutions, many stakeholders have established innovative and alternative forms of governance in recent years. And again, the climate change sector is pioneering the field with a lot of initiative, what, uh, initiatives, especially voluntary initiatives. However, as Manu Fischer emphasized, there's a disconnect between decision making at the global level and implementation at the local level. Um, yeah, and there's a broad variety of commitments by subnational units. So Anna Kozovac and Daniel Pedic emphasize um, the potential of cities. And Philip Hartberg and Montserrat Kolofon spoke about partnerships between public actors, business, and civil society. This is a, a slide um, from the lecture by uh, Anna Kozovac and Daniel Pedic and really gave me hope, therefore I included this in, into my presentation too. They do surveys among cities, and what you can see here is that before and after the corona pandemic, um, or now it's still ongoing, but now in February they did their last survey. They asked uh, city mayors like what the top issues for international engagement are. And number one is climate change. Yeah. So at least at the local people, <laughs> uh, local level people have realized that climate change is an important issue we need to address. Um, so there's a lot of hope in the local level and cities, and there's also kind of a rediscovery of the local. So there's a growing body of research that deals with the cities and city networks, especially in the context of climate change. There's the C40 network with 96 cities that produce 25% of global GDP. And another example is the Global Convenient of Mayors with over 9,000 cities representing nearly 800 million people or 10% of the global population. So there's an increasing acknowledgement of the local level and also of local knowledge. This is something Daniela Kleinschmidt and Laila Meta, among others, emphasized in their lectures and including then alternative knowledge, like indigenous knowledge that, uh, that is not, and, yeah, was and still is not very much recognized at the global level so far. Then we had a, one lecture specifically on multi-stakeholder partnerships, but also other lecturers emphasized, highlighted the need for more holistic approaches, including uh, multi, or, and multi-stakeholder approaches, including multi-stakeholder partnerships, for example, Ma Manuel Fischer. The SDG, this one goal, SDG 17, is particularly on partnerships, partnerships for the goal, and it recognizes interlinkages among the SDGs instead of what I mentioned before, this thinking in silos. However, and I wish I could end here on a more positive note, but Philip Patbeck and Montserrat Kolofan said that there's not very much evidence that the partnership community is very active. More than that, um, other scholars um, yeah, shared more skepticism regarding environmental commitments by the private sector. Daniela Kleinschmidt reminded us that the private logging companies, the big logging companies, became very powerful against the backdrop of colonialism, and they continue to uphold principles of wood production and international markets, um, rather than forest protection. Alice Vadro warned us that also private companies sometimes use or misuse partnerships to collect and own ocean data. In her case, she works on global ocean governance including baseline data to which public scientific institutions do not always have access here. Yeah, so very careful formulation here. So if private sector, com sector commitment is not really what we should focus on, then at least some lecturers were very optimistic regarding bottom-up civil society organizations. Environmental movements started early to pave the way for sustainability governance. Probably without the movements, there wouldn't be 
any talk about sustainability or environmental protection at all. I had originally asked the lecturers to start in, with the Rio Earth Summit in 1992, but Daniela Kleinschmidt, and she also said this in the lecture, uh, said it's not possible to start in 1992 because the forest movements were very strong back in the 1980s, um, rainforest protection movements, um, boycotts against uh, tropical timber and so on. Now, especially before the coronavirus pandemic, we had record numbers of environmental activists, including, and this is something very nice, including people from the Global South. So environmental activism is no longer an issue only of, of Western countries and the Global North. And then some researchers also told us about uh, close ties between researchers and activists. For example, Ekaterina Shatkovskaya, uh, who works on the Stigold concept, and she works together with uh, activists. And then another example is Sherilyn McGregor, uh, who's involved with um, the ecofeminist movement. So I come to my conclusion and outlook. Um, yeah, the three pillar concept of sustainable development and a thinking in silos prevails in global sustainability governance. And at the same time, the environment is increasingly seen as a global commodity or as a result of this, as, as a result of trying to integrate the environmental, economic, and social dimension. The environment is increasingly seen as a global commodity, which then causes tension between those who have the means to exploit natural resources and those who do not. So we do not really see tensions between those who continue to pollute the environment and overexploit the environment and those who suffer the most, but we see tensions between those who, um, who make a profit out of the environment and others who also want to uh, participate and uh, ask for greater redistribu uh, redistribution of the profits. Um, and that's quite sad. <laughs> um, then on the one hand, it's very nice to see all the different initiatives and it seems a lot is going on in this field of environmental governance, but all Lecturers agree that the fragmented and polycentric institutional landscape of global sustainability governance hinders effective governance. Voluntary actions um, give hope, yeah, as an alternative form of governance, um, especially alignment of bottom-up civil society initiatives. But again, there needs to be we need more coordination to be effective. So I end by saying that. Global governance reforms are needed towards greater environmental sustainability. I wish I could end on a more positive note, but the environment is not in a very good position in global sustainability governance. And I hope that at least with this lecture series, you get a better understanding of what the problems are. And I could convince you to also become advocates for stronger environmental institutions. These are my references. Thank you very much for your attention.